Hi, my name's Caitlin and recently on the news there's been a lot of coverage of the case of Fred and Rose West and I wanted to cover it on my channel today because I haven't really heard of it or never looked into it and there's new evidence being brought up about one of the victims, like one of the potential victims uh, of Fred and Rose West so I wanted to cover it all today and just like in the other videos that I've done uh, we're going to be looking at the psychology side of it as well. We're just going to touch lightly on it towards the end of the video. So if that's something that you're interested in, please stick around. Just a quick disclaimer, I'm not a psychology teacher. I'm a psychology student and I'm in my final year and psychology is just something that I enjoy. And all the information that I get for this video is either from news articles or research articles. And I also want to put out a trigger warning as well. There will be mentions of suicide, sexual violence and paedophilia. So if that's something that you you're not really comfortable listening to, then I'd advise clicking off the video now. On September 29th, 1941, Frederick West was born to Walter and Daisy West in England. As a young boy, Fred was described as being like any other young boy and his aunt had once said that he has always been such a nice boy, while a neighbour did say that he could be quite cheeky and mouthy at times, but she just put that down to children being children. Among his five siblings, Fred was believed to be his mother's favourite, However, it was speculated that his mother did sexually abuse him as a child. As well as this, Fred did later on tell police that his father had incestuous relations with young girls, but this was never proven to be true. There wasn't enough evidence for it. Fred wasn't very good at school and he ended up dropping out quite young and he became a farm labourer. And not too long after this, at the age of 17, he ended up getting into a motorbike accident which caused him to be in a coma for a week and he fractured his skull giving him some brain trauma and experts do think that this brain trauma is what's basically caused him to act out the way that he did. This is quite similar to the case that we talked about a couple of days ago uh, of Mary Bell and she ended up being thrown out of a window and she damaged her prefrontal cortex and this is an important part of the brain for decision making and it could be speculated that that was one of the reasons which caused her to start murdering people. So you could say the same for Fred as well. Maybe whichever, I couldn't find which particular part of his brain received the trauma, but um, it could be speculated that this was one of the factors which contributed to him murdering later on in life. Following this motorbike accident, it was said that Fred's behaviour changed greatly. He began getting involved in the police and he became quite known to the police for petty crimes that he committed. In 1961, Fred was accused of impregnating a 13-year-old girl. Nothing was really done about this. They decided to let him go because he claimed that he was having fits from the brain trauma that he had gotten a couple of years before this. But he was charged of child molestation. Sorry, I can't pronounce that that's as good as it's getting. After like this whole big case then of him possibly impregnating this 13 year old girl, he was kicked out of his family home. He ended up getting a new job, he became a construction worker and this didn't really last very long either because he began stealing from his employer and he was also having sex with other minors. Not too long after this, Fred had met a woman called Rena Costello and she was a Scottish woman who had also been in trouble with the police quite a bit for burglary and prostitution. Whenever they both met, Rena was pregnant with another man's child and they kind of hit it off because by 1962 they both decided that they'd get married and she gave birth to her baby and they both decided to call her Charmaine. Now you might be thinking, oh this is lovely for Fred, he's got a nice little family now, he's married, he's got a stepdaughter. Um, but things just got worse. He got a new job as an ice cream van driver and this just gave him constant access to young teenage girls. Just two years after the marriage, in 1964, Fred and Rena had their own child together called Anne-Marie. And shortly after this, they met a woman called Anne McFall. Um, and they ended up moving to Gloucestershire with her. Shortly after the three had moved to Gloucestershire, Police began getting a lot of reports of assault and eight of the reports gave descriptions and each of these descriptions did describe Fred. However, he had never been linked to these assaults at the time. During this time also, Rena and Fred's marriage began to, I guess, 
break down and Rena decided that she wanted to move back to Scotland and she left her two children, Charmaine and Anne-Marie, with Fred and their friend Anne McFall. She didn't stay away for too long. She ended up moving back to Gloucestershire just a couple of months later and she found that Fred and Anne had moved into a caravan. A couple of years later, in 1967, Anne became pregnant with Fred's child and Anne had told Fred that she wanted him to divorce Rena so that the both of them could be together and Fred wasn't too keen on this. He wanted to stay with Rena. So in July of 1967, Fred decided that he would murder Anne and his unborn child. He ended up burying Anne's body not too far away from the caravan and he ended up cutting off her fingers and toes. And this dismemberment became, I guess, a key signature of Fred's murder sprees. And it was not too long after Anne's death whenever Rena moved back into the caravan with Fred. Only six months after Anne's death, in January 1968, uh, a 15 year old girl called Mary Bastholm, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but this is the uh, young woman who the evidence is now coming to light about on the news at the minute. Um, but she was believed to be abducted at a bus stop in Gloucestershire, although at the time there was only circumstantial evidence so there wasn't really much done about it, it was just speculated. It was never confirmed whether Fred actually was the reason for Mary's disappearance or not. By the end of 1968, in November, Fred became acquainted with a woman called Rose Letts and she was soon to be his wife and long life accomplice. Now let's talk a little bit about Rose. Um, she is just as guilty as Fred in all of these murders. In November 29th, 1953, Rose Letts was born in Devon, England, and both of her parents had very severe mental illnesses. Her mother had to go through electroconversion therapy whenever she was pregnant with Rose for deep depression, and it was believed that this electroconversion therapy is what caused bouts of aggression and poor performance in Rose whenever she was born and obviously whenever she got a bit older. Rose didn't really have the easiest upbringing. Her father was a paranoid schizophrenic and her mother ended up moving out of the house and she ended up taking Rose with her as well but it wasn't too long before Rose decided to move back in with her father during her teens and it was also during this time whenever Rose became intimate with Fred. Rose's father did not like Fred one bit. He objected very strongly to the two being together. He ended up contacting social services as a way of trying to get rid of Fred. And he also directly threatened Fred as well, but nothing seemed to work. And the pair then became pregnant with a child together. And while in prison, Rose ended up having to look after Fred's other two children, Charmaine and Amory. Rose then gave birth to her own child called Heather in 1970. After the birth of Heather, Rena decides that she wants to go and find her children, Amory and Charmaine. And Fred decides to strangle her and he buries her in the same place where he buried Anne McFall. And he also cut off her fingers and her toes just like he did to Anne as well. Just shortly after Rena's murder, Fred ended up in prison once again and during his imprisonment, Rose decided to kill Charmaine, who was only eight years old at the time. And whenever Fred finally got out of prison, he just buried her body at the property that they were currently living in. That absolutely breaks my heart. Like she's only eight years old and another woman comes into the picture and murders his own child and he just doesn't really care, he just buries the body as if it's another job to get done. In 1972, Fred and Rose then decided to get secretly married and shortly after this they had a, their second daughter called May and because their family was slowly starting to increase now, they decided that they needed to move somewhere bigger and they moved to a place called 25 Cromwell Street. Uh, which was a big enough place which allowed them to have lodgers to assist them with their rent. During this time Rose was making quite a bit of money from prostitution and Fred was committing horrible acts of bondage and violent sex on underage girls and he ended up changing the whole cellar in their house to a torture chamber and unfortunately his daughter Amory became the first victim of this torture chamber. Um, her father Fred raped her while her stepmother Rose held her down. 
This soon became a regular occurrence for Anne-Marie and she was threatened that if she told anybody about this, she would be beaten. During the same year, Fred and Rose decided to hire a nanny who was only 17 years old called Caroline Owens. And unfortunately, she was also raped and stripped. And she luckily managed to escape and she reported this to the police. And charges were brought against them, but despite... Fred's criminal record, uh, he was able to convince the court Owens had consented to everything that he did to her. Obviously, Caroline was very traumatized from this whole experience and she was that traumatized that she couldn't even give a testimony against Rose and Fred. And unfortunately, the both of them were just led away with this crime and they were given fines. And not too long after this, Rose became pregnant again with her first son called Stephen and he was born in August. Over the next couple of years, Fred and Rose's victim list just gradually increased and I'm just gonna list their names and tell you a little bit about them. So Linda Gaw was one of the first victims. She was reported missing by her parents in April 1973 and she was friendly with lodgers at the house that Fred and Rose had and she also was known to have sex with Fred and Rose. Carol Ann Cooper was only 15 years old whenever she disappeared. She went missing on November 10th, 1973 after she had been getting a bus to return home after a night out. Detectives concluded that Fred and Rose West ended up picking her up whenever she was hitchhiking a left home and her body was found under the cellar in 25 Cromwell Street. Lucy Partington was only 21 years old whenever she went missing. Uh, she was a university student and she disappeared two days after Christmas in 1973. It was believed that once again Rose and Fred picked her up whenever she was waiting for the bus to go home. Um, her mother ended up reporting her missing to police and this sparked a huge investigation and her remains were also found under the cellar in 25 Cromwell Street. Next is Teresa. I don't know how to pronounce her last name but I'll put her name on the screen so you can have it. But she was only 21 whenever she went missing. Uh, she was a London college student and she had disappeared on Easter 1974, just a couple of months after Lucy had gone missing. She was setting out to hitchhike to Ireland so that she could see her friend who was a priest. Wasn't known to have any previous connections to Fred and Rose, however, her body was found under the cellar in 25 Cromwell Street. Shirley Hubbard was only 15 years old whenever she disappeared and she was the youngest out of all of Fred and Rose's victims beside Charmaine. Whenever she had went missing, police could not find a trace of her and her body was later found under the cellar in 25 Cromwell Street. The next victim, I can't pronounce her first name, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but I'll put her name on the screen as well. She was only 18 whenever she vanished and she went missing a day before her friend's wedding in April 1975 and obviously her remains were found under the cellar in 25 Cromwell Street um, and it was after her death that all the bodies beneath the cellar were arranged in a clockwise fashion and they were all cemented over and the room was then turned into a room for Rose and Fred's children. The murders didn't stop there though. The next victim was a woman called Shirley Robinson. She was only 16 years old whenever she was murdered. Um, she was a lodger with Fred and Rose and she actually became pregnant with Fred's child and she was last seen in May 1978 whenever she was eight months pregnant and her body with the fetus were both buried in the garden of the West's home. The last victim was Alison Chambers. She lived in a children's home and had become quite a frequent visitor to 25 Cromwell Street and she ended up disappearing on August 1979, just before her 17th birthday, and her remains were unfortunately found in the back of the garden at 25 Cromwell Street too. All of these murders all ended up being very brutal and they were all dismembered. Like I said before, he tended to mutilate these women's bodies and he'd cut their fingers and toes off as a sort of signature. After all of these murders, Rose ended up having a few more children. However, all of these children weren't believed to be Fred's children. She had a daughter in 1978 called Louise. Then two years later in 1980, she had a son called Barry. And then another two years after this, she had another daughter called Rosemary Jr. Just a year later in 1983, she had a daughter called 
Luciana. Now all of these children obviously had some idea that something was going on however they were all sort of controlled I guess by Rose and Fred and they were only allowed to do certain things within the house so that they wouldn't find out the full extent to what Fred and Rose were doing. Fred obviously never changed. His sexual interest in his daughter's did not ever disappear and after his oldest daughter Amory moved out with her boyfriend Fred's interest began to settle on the younger siblings. Heather and May were the victims in this. Heather ended up resisting Fred and in 1987 she decided to tell a friend what had been going on in her home and Rose and Fred responded to this by murdering Heather and dismembering her body and they buried her in the back garden with the other two bodies and they also made their son Stephen help them bury his own sister. Obviously every time Fred and Rose committed these sexual acts on somebody um, they didn't kill their victims every time so this accumulated number of attacks ended up becoming noticed by the police and Detective Constable Hazel Savage ended up searching 25 Cromwell Street and they found evidence of child abuse in the house and they also found pornography. Both Rose and Fred were arrested. Fred was arrested for rape and sodomy of a minor and Rose was arrested for assisting these rapes. Savage was able to uncover all of the abuse and just trauma that Anne-Marie had to go through as she was growing up and she also investigated the disappearance of Charmaine and Heather. Rumours began to rise that both of these girls bodies were buried under the patio in the back garden and thankfully all of Fred and Rose's younger children were all taken into child protective services. During this time also Rose tried to commit suicide but her son ended up finding her and he revived her. Now this all seems like it's starting to take a good turn but unfortunately the case began to collapse because witnesses were refusing to testify against Fred and Rose and also whenever the children were being questioned they refused to give any information because of course they were basically indoctrinated by their parents and they were trained very well to not give away any information to police. In February 1994 the police were able to obtain a warrant to search the house. They also were able to search the back garden and found two bodies of young women who had been dismembered and decapitated and one of these young women they believed was Shirley Robinson who went missing almost 20 years prior to this search. Whenever these murders started coming to light, Fred claimed all responsibility for the murders. However, Rose denied any participation in the murders and she also denied the knowledge of Heather's death. During this time, Fred also cooperated with police to allow them to know where Anne McFall, Rena, and also Charmaine's bodies had been buried. As the case began to develop and Fred cooperated more with the police and told them where bodies had been buried, Rose really did try to distance herself from Fred so that she wouldn't get convicted of these murders the way Fred would and police were not convinced by this whatsoever and they knew that by the large number of murders that had took place they knew that Fred didn't act alone to do all this. On December 13th 1994 Fred was finally convicted of 12 counts of murder and he ended up hanging himself in January 1995 using his bed sheets in prison. In October 3rd, 1995, Rose then went to trial and her stepdaughter Amory testified against her. She was obviously testifying for the sexual assault that Rose helped Fred commit on her. Rose's defense was that sexual assault doesn't equal murder. However, the jury did come to realize how dishonest Rose could be and they just ended up not believing her. It wasn't too long after this, on November 22nd, 1995, that it was unanimously agreed that she would get done for 10 counts of murder and she received life in prison with a minimum of 25 years in jail. However, this was extended to a whole life in prison without the possibility of parole. Rose basically tried to do, I guess she was in a stage of denial where she refused to believe that she would, had took any part in any of these murders and she had tried a couple of times to appeal in court in 1996 and in 2000 claiming that new evidence had cleared her name um, but each of these appeals were rejected each time and to this day she still remains incarcerated. 
Actually, I don't know if she's still alive. So apparently Rose West is still alive. So she's still serving her sentence in prison for all of the murders and sexual assault that she took part in. That's basically the case though. Um, 25 Cromwell Street became known as the House of Horrors. And it is also believed that there is way more victims than 12 that which were found. They think that there's a lot more that Fred didn't let on to. So I want to quickly mention some of the new evidence that has been coming out recently. Um, if you remember towards the start of the video I mentioned a possible victim called Mary Bathams. I think that's how you pronounce her last name. I'm really not sure. But recently there has been a lot of news coverage. ITV production crew suggested to police that uh, there is a possibility that Mary's body is under the cellar of this now cafe. They did, I, I'm not really sure what the right technical term is, but they did get imaging of what was a blue coloured clothing, I guess, or material. And it was mentioned that Mary was wearing a blue coat whenever she was last seen. And then I'd also read as well that a journalist um, had said that he believes that he is one of the last people to see Mary alive. And uh, he claims that he seen Mary standing at the bus stop which was also mentioned beforehand they knew about this but she was standing at a bus stop and he said that he seen a grey van pulling up beside Mary and she ended up talking with he wasn't sure if it was one person or a man and a woman um but she was picked off and driven away in this grey van and he of course informed the police but the police never followed this up uh, which is very frustrating because although maybe they might not have found her alive but her parents would have gotten a bit of closure before they unfortunately passed away um so it is very sad if this is the case that it really was her and the police just didn't take on board the evidence that they were given so that's the full case i'm gonna go over some of the psychology now of it so if you're not really interested in that you can click off thank you for joining me um but yeah let's look at some of the psychology with Fred first. So obviously his background history, it's not good. It did, whenever I first read it, it did raise a lot of alarm bells for me because there did seem to be a lot of factors which had the possibility to build up to create what was Fred West. Of course, I'll begin with the unfortunate sexual abuse from his mother, Daisy. Like anyone, sexual abuse is gonna cause trauma and research by Mullen et al showed that children who have experienced a form of physical emotional or sexual abuse tend to increase the likelihood of developing psychopathology or sexual difficulties they sometimes have decreased self-esteem and they also have interpersonal problems for anybody who isn't aware psychopathology tends to just describe mental illnesses so this could range from schizophrenia bipolar disorder depression you know just sort of general mental illnesses but this research by Mullen et al basically brought light to the idea that sexual abuse could lead to sexual problems later on in life this could potentially give some reason as to why Fred was attracted to younger girls. Um, and I'm not trying to, you know, say that, oh, he went through this as a child, so it's okay for him to be a pedophile. It's not, it's, it's an awful thing, but you know, this might have contributed to the way that he ended up acting as he was older. There was also other research by Pelusi et al, I think that's how you pronounce it, I'm not sure. And he suggested that sexual abuse during childhood would increase the likelihood of sexual offences in adult life. This research sort of gives a bit more evidence as to maybe why he preyed on younger girls. Um, but it could also suggest why he raped people as well. Um, but I mean there could be a lot of other different factors which played into it. It is generally known that childhood trauma such as that which Fred experienced from both his mother and his father, um, this could lead to violence later on in adulthood. Now let's move on from a little bit less of a sensitive topic to the motorbike accident that Fred had. Like I said before I couldn't find which part of his brain was actually damaged. All it was saying was that he had a fractured skull. Obviously we can take from this that he did have a bit of brain damage. 
Um, so let's talk a bit about the impact that brain damage can have on violence. Of course, a lot of these studies into brain injuries are not going to be completely applicable to Fred West because brain injury is different from person to person depending on um, what part of your brain's been damaged, like how much of your brain's been damaged. Um, like one person could have like a tiny bit of their prefrontal cortex damaged and then like a huge part of their temporal lobe damaged. Like it's completely different each time. But I'm just going to give you like a general overview of the potential impact that brain injury can have on aggression and violence within an individual. So one study did find that brain injuries are more likely to lead to long-term aggression even after a brain injury occurs. So maybe in some cases there have been a aggression which maybe lasted for a couple of months after the injury. However, this study found that in their participants, the brain trauma lasted for a very long time. So there is a possibility that this could have happened to Fred where he was injured and it just, I guess, enhanced the aggression which he had um, and then he ended up performing these acts of aggression on women. Um, another study did find that aggression in brain trauma patients tended to range from 11% to 34%, but of course, like I said before, like this number is quite a large range because of each brain injury being different but it does add a bit more evidence to the fact that brain trauma can cause aggression in an individual. Personally from my perspective I think that his brain trauma was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back because I know not that I personally know but I, I, I know that sexual abuse can cause a lot of trauma and a lot of mental illnesses in people. Um, it's an awful thing for somebody to have to go through, especially as a child, like they have to live with that trauma for the rest of their life and it affects them as an adult as well. Um, but I think had Fred been surrounded by the right people and the right support system, um, I think he might've been able to pull himself out of this and make a life for himself um, that wasn't involved in murder um, I mean, there could have been the potential for mental illnesses, unfortunately, but I think it wouldn't have been as bad as what it ended up being. Um, I think the brain trauma just is what kind of pushed him over the edge a bit. And obviously it had the potential to increase his aggression acts. I mean, there is the possibility that his brain trauma like completely flipped his personality as well like it could have just made him somebody that he just wasn't before the accident there wasn't an awful lot on rose but it was mentioned obviously about the electroconvulsion therapy that her mother went through while she was pregnant with rose now i wasn't able to find a lot of research on electroconvulsion therapy during pregnancy i guess it's a bit more of a sensitive subject to be researching um but i did find research by Lakeness, I, <laughs> I'm destroying names today. I'm gonna put the name on the screen just so you can read it. But they explored the impact which electroconvulsion therapy can have on a fetus. They did find that electroconvulsion therapy is very fatal to an unborn child and the mortality rate was 7.1% for a child. Um, however, there was no mentions of this causing aggression later on in life. However, I don't think there was that much research done into it. So maybe if there was more research done into the area showing uh, the effects this has later on in life for people, um, maybe it would be able to explain Rose's situation a little bit more. But that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, it was a lot to take in. For the psychology aspect of it, of course, I am not saying that the reasons that I gave were the reasons why Rose and Fred committed the murders. Like, it could have been a number of amount of different things. It's just my opinion. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not trained to diagnose anybody in anything. So, um, this is just for a bit of fun and I just wanted to share a little bit of the psychology side of it and research into it. Um, I'm going to leave the links down of the researches that I use so if you do want to read the full article they're going to be in the description if you do want to have a read of them. Um, but yeah I hope you enjoyed the video if you did make sure to hit the thumbs up button. Also feel free to subscribe for more videos. I also did a video the other day on uh, Britain's 
no most notorious child killer called Mary Bell. Um, so if you're interested in that, go check it out. And hopefully I will see you for another video. Bye!